welcome to Dead Man Talking. Big thank you to everybody, all of you, every single one of you. 4,000 subscribers um, as of 6 o'clock uh, this morning, British time of course. Um, I'm overwhelmed guys, as you know, uh, throughout this entire journey. Um, it's been amazing and uh, the people I've worked with and working with currently, such as DDoS, Kirsten, um, Swamp Dweller, there's so many different names, Creeping Van Pasta, uh, CTP, um, you know, there's so many people that have been involved in this uh, wonderful journey, including yourselves and everyone that's got in touch with their own, their own stories. Um, really do appreciate it. I hope you have enjoyed the past 10 months as much as I have and uh, look forward to the future as much as I do. Without further ado guys, tonight's episode of Forest of Fear and we have some special guests. Without further ado though, let's get into tonight's first story entitled They Were In My Rear View Mirror. Let's get straight into that. Last November, I came home from college for Thanksgiving break. My school is across the state from my parents' house, so I had to leave early in the morning just to get there by noon. I stayed all weekend and I was due back for classes Monday morning. I had planned to leave around noon on Sunday, but mum had convinced me to stay for dinner one last time, as I wouldn't be seeing my family till Christmas. As a consequence, I didn't end up leaving until 8pm. I needed to book it if I hoped to get back in time and get a few hours of sleep before I had to go to class the next morning. The first hour of tour driving was pretty uneventful. I always hated driving on the freeway, so I took the country roads, which added about an hour or so to my drive time, but made it easier on my mind. The trees and dark sky flying by my window became a blur, and I found myself dozing off. To wake myself up, I turned on the radio but received nothing but static. I cursed and turned it off. A little while later, I saw headlights appear in my rearview mirror. It was a red Mercedes, driving about Mach 2 over the speed limit. I could hear its motor coming five minutes before I even saw it. It came up behind my Accord pretty quickly and began tailgating. He even tapped my bumper a few times. I tried to speed up, but that would just cause him to do the same. Eventually, he finally clicked his turn signals and passed me, giving me the finger as he drove by. After he was in front, he gunned the engine again and drove off, leaving me alone. I tried fiddling with my radio some more, but there was still nothing but static. While my eyes were off the road, a light suddenly filled the interior of the car. Looking behind me, I saw two extremely bright headlights on the road behind me. I really wasn't excited to have another dude riding my ass, so I began to speed up. Much like the last guy, the car sped up behind me until the headlights filled my back windshield. I tried to look back at it through the rearview mirror, but the bright lights prevented me from looking at them for more than a few seconds at a time. Suddenly, there was a loud crashing noise and my car gave a painful lurch. Looking back, I saw that the headlights were practically right up against the glass. The crash came again and this time accompanied by a loud scraping noise. What was this guy's problem? The last one had just tapped my bumper. This one seemed to think we were in a fucking demolition derby. There was an even louder crash followed by the sound of shattering glass. My rear windshield broke into hundreds of pieces and my car lurched and squealed again. The other car nearly driving me off the road. Yelling, I swerved to the left and crossed the centre line, heading straight into the ditch on the side of the road. The upper left hand tire dug into the muddy earth as I pitched forward, hitting my head hard on the steering wheel. Dazed, I looked back towards the road and heard another screeching noise, but this time it sounded distant. I was alone. The other car must have sped off. Hit and run. Great way to start the holidays. Getting out of my car, I walked around to the back and stopped dead in my tracks. 
The rear of my car was almost totaled. The glass was cracked or non-existent. Huge gashes covered the metal, stripping the paint and scratching the metal. There were chunks missing in some places. I didn't know what souped up foreign car the dude had been driving, but it must have been a quite a number to do such a job on my car. He was behind me, so I couldn't even get a license plate. I'd have to call the insurance company in the morning. Right now, I had to worry about getting back to school on time. It took me about 10 minutes to get my car out of the ditch. I looked disdainfully back at the shattered glass. It would be cold, but at least it wasn't raining. I got my bearings together and began driving again, making sure to go a little bit over the speed limit. I didn't want any other unwelcome visitors tonight. After I had been driving for about six or seven minutes, I saw something appear in the road in front of my headlights. I slammed on the brakes just in time to see it disappear under my front bumper, but not go under the wheels. <sighs> I sighed in relief. At least I had avoided another call to my insurance company. I left the lights on and got out, walking to the front of my car and staring down. I felt my breath catch in my throat. Despite the low lights, I recoiled in horror at what lay on the road. It was a body of a man, covered in blood and claw marks. Huge chunks of his flesh were missing, and what remained of his face was unrecognisable. I could see bones sticking out in some places, and what skin remained was covered in huge gashes or road burn. A pungent metallic smell filled the air. Looking to the right, I saw the twisted and smoking remains of a red Mercedes lying on its side in the ditch on the right side of the road. The damage done made my car look like it had just come off the assembly line. I could smell leaking gasoline. The wind picked up then, rustling the branches overhead. Lights moved distantly between the trees. Twigs snapped. A chorus of screeches and shrieks, some far away, some close, filled the air and floated up into the star-filled sky. Right before I ran back to my car, one fleeting thought filled my mind. Not headlights, eyes. Mostly because I grew up in northern Ontario and it's rare to see it mentioned on the internet at all, I was shocked to read a post by someone which detailed their experience as on a camping trip around the area I'm from. I had read the post simply out of curiosity, but some of the things written in it stood out to me. When I investigated the comments and found out the author was describing the exact area in which I grew up, I certainly hadn't expected that. Ontario's gigantic. What are the odds? My blood ran cold. First, I think I should provide some background. As I said above, northern Ontario constitutes a large area of Canada and even Ontario. Besides this, it's sparsely populated, the towns are small, few, and far between, linked only by the Trans-Canadian Highway, and between them, long swath of dense, dark forest. Maybe a few trails for skiing, but largely uninhabited. I grew up near these forests, but didn't really venture into them too much until my dad bought a large property when I was about 10. The property was gigantic, about 500 acres, dirt cheap, and mostly forest or exposed rocks that so characterizes the Canadian Shield landscape. Someone there had owned horses, so there were two very overgrown fields, grass up past your head, and a couple chicken coops. It even had some trails running through part of it, from a house to a large river where we could go swimming in to an abandoned mine shaft and connecting to the backs of other properties. Despite the worries of bears, and I can't count how many bears I've come across there, I hiked these trails nearly daily. I always loved the outdoors, and there was nothing I liked better than being alone in the middle of nowhere, not another human in sight. Of course, I brought my dog Rudy with me for safety. 
He was an expert bear chaser. Mostly these walks were uneventful. I would get to the river, take a swim, and head back home. The walk there and back took about two hours. The creepiest part was probably the last leg to the river. You would break out of the forest to some rolling plains, which were bare due to the large power lines up. You would take the trail along these hills parallel to the forest until you reached the water. There was a loud droning hum in the air the entire way due to the power lines. Besides that, complete silence except for my own voice. I always sang on the trails. It was a good way to warn bears away from you. The thing about bears is they don't want to fight you or even be near you. If you give them a good warning that you are approaching, they usually clear out. Some people play radios. I would sing. The first thing that I can remember happening was that I was walking along the hill path singing like I always did and the droning silence behind my voice was broken by a weird bleeding sound. Rudy took off running towards it immediately so I followed him cautiously. I thought it might be a deer or something. So I was intrigued. For how large the property was I never really saw a deer on it except once which I'm getting to, so I was curious. When I caught up to Rudy, he was cornering the path next to the woods, barking furiously. I hung back a couple yards because it immediately became apparent to me that this was not a deer. I couldn't see what it was, but I could see the bush thrashing wildly, the tree branches swinging low to the ground. Whatever it was, Rudy had frightened it back into the cover. But the size of the animal required to make that large of a racket had me suspecting a bear. It wasn't retreating, but it wasn't about to continue forward, so I turned around and headed home. The next day I was in the house, and it was near twilight. I had an unspoken rule. I never went outside after dark. You would be stupid, too. Everyone has stories about a relative attacked by coyotes after dark or coming in between an aggressive bear and your garbage can, so I stayed inside. I was on my balcony reading when my brother pointed out something in the fields to me. The fact we could see this thing at the all was amazing. The grass in the field was high due to the years of neglect, but there it was, this massive buck. He was enormous, at least eight feet tall. We thought it might be a moose at first, but his face was far too delicate looking. And there was no mistaking those giant sharp antlers. He stood in the field gazing at our house, not moving as the sky darkened. It must have left in the night. My brother was angry the next morning. He was woken up several times throughout the night as Rudy had been barking at something. He reported hearing an odd noise, but was mostly just mad at the dog. I didn't think anything much of it. We thought he had chased away the deer or something. Inspecting of the chicken coops when we went to feed them before school revealed that some of our hens were missing. And we found the feathery remains of one of them a yard or so away from the coop on the edge of the horse field. Maybe Rudy had been chasing away raccoons or foxes instead. I don't know when this happened, but it was some time after. On our way home from school, the bus dropped us off on the edge of the highway, and we would have a long walk home down the driveway. We looked down the side of the path and saw something standing about 200 meters away. I went to see my brother last week, and... I brought it up with him because it had been on my mind since I read that post. I asked him if he remembered that time we were walking from the bus and we saw something. He said yes, laughed a bit, and I asked him to describe it. It was tall, white, on two feet, he said. See, I thought so too. I remember it being on four feet at first, and then standing up until it was on two. 
I remember it was white. It was white. It looked a bit like a deer. And we saw it. And it must have seen us because it just walked away into the woods on two feet. I don't know what it was, though. Did you ever see it again? No. I had, though. For a while, I kept hearing the weird bleeding noise at night, and our chickens kept disappearing. Then our ducks went, even though they were locked into a coop at night. Then the feral cat colony in the barn started being picked off a couple at a time. I dreamed about messed up animal once around that time. It was an animal that began as a crane flying low to the ground and morphed into a decaying centaur-like creature as it stumbled to the ground from flight. It shapeshifted, tumorous and bruised. It was screaming in that bleeding voice, almost like a human, but not quite. Sniffed the air blindly, charging at me. I woke up just as it touched me. I don't know what it was. Maybe I was just upset by the cats disappearing and our livestock going, and I had a nightmare about it. Maybe it was nothing. I'm not here to say any of this was something supernatural, just that it happened and that it was weird. Eventually, we stopped hearing the bleeding noises at night. I stopped hiking. I moved away to go to school. When my boyfriend and I visited my dad at his property and I took him for a walk, he said the place gave him the heebie-jeebies. Why? This feels like prime Wendigo country. What the hell's a Wendigo? I'll tell you what a Wendigo is now that I know. Back in the day, if a community became cut off from food, they might resort to cannibalism in order to survive. But it caused madness. It was also called Wendigo sickness. Was it only a legend created to explain these people who would resort to eating family and friends? A Wendigo is a witch. Ojibwes and many other indigenous people have a legend about Wendigos. It is a witch. It was a person that desired power so badly that they paid a terrible price for the ability to shapeshift and immortality. They became mad with corruption. They were always hungry and feed on anything, but above all else, they were cannibals. They are so old and wretched that they look like zombies in their real form, graying skin, narcosis, bloated bellies from gorging themselves on any flesh they can find. Wendigos are pure greed and hunger. They can shapeshift. They can turn into a person, into an animal. A masterful Wendigo can imitate a human voice or a baby's crying to lure you over. Get you lost in the woods, then they strike. They can infiltrate a group and pick you off one by one. They mostly hunt at night. You are Never supposed to whistle at night because it attracts bad spirits, Wendigos included. Northern Ontario is unceded indigenous land. Upon further investigation, I realized that my boyfriend was right. This was prime Wendigo country. I had been so preoccupied with singing to keep away bears that I had never thought about what I might be luring home with me. By the light of a dying fire. Let's get straight into that. Ever since history began, mankind has been fascinated by fire. In the days of the caveman, the hunter's campfire was often the only thing that protected our prehistoric ancestors from the predators that prowled the dark. The scenario must have been terrifying as the caveman sat around their fire knowing that death watched from the shadows. Something about this experience must have imprinted itself upon the human race back in those days. For even today, a campfire can bring a chill to most people's spine, given the right circumstances. 
And one of the favourite pastimes on camping trips is to sit around the fire and tell scary stories. Many may find this tradition old fashioned and cheesy, but I always felt a small thrill. Whenever the talk would turn to the towers of dark and disturbing, while I was in the Boy Scouts. There is one night in particular that sticks in my memory. And when I tell people about it, they are surprised that I'm not in therapy. People sometimes ask me, what's the scariest thing I've ever experienced? They're usually surprised when I tell them that I have to think about it for a while. I may not look like the sort of person that strange things happen to, but I have had far more than my fair share of weirdness in my life. One of these stories I have already told on No Sleep. This is another such story. To begin with, I have to provide some background information. I'm the oldest son of a large family and I live in the northeastern United States. Once again, I've had to fudge the names of people and geographic locations, although some people may be able to recognize the places and people I am referring to. One of the greatest joys of my high school life were the activities with the Boy Scouts. I am an Eagle Scout and a Brotherhood member of the Order of the Arrow, Scouting's Honor Society. So, I am no stranger to the outdoors. In fact, I so loved scouting that once I was old enough, I joined the staff of Six Hill Scout Camp as a summer camp counselor. Like most summer camps, I had co-workers who were among most of the awesome people that I've ever met. Others who I had wish I'd never met, and a whole lot of people in between. The two people that I'd hung out with the most were my friends, Topher and Joe. I actually ended up going to the same college as Topher, and that was how we became friends, but that is another story. Topher was a very logical guy who loved studying the plants and animals of the wilderness, and frequently expounded upon them at length, while Joe was more bookish and shy. The three of us were about the same age and after our junior year of college, Joe found himself a girlfriend named Anne who frequently visited the camp. Unfortunately for every Topher and Joe, there was a Kyle. Kyle was one of those people who made my skin crawl. And yet for some reason, most women found him irresistible. Kyle would frequently string along several lovesick girls at once Use them for what he wanted, drop them in the dirt afterwards, and then brag about it. Needless to say, no one could stand him, and the only reason he was on camp staff was because his uncle was camp director. The last person on camp staff to play into this story was Bert. Bert ran the camp's health lodge and was primarily responsible for giving out medications to the campers that needed it. The fact that Burtz was in charge of the health lodge was a source of great amusement to most of the campers, as he was very old and not in the best of shape. In fact, he often drove around the camp in a golf cart as he couldn't walk long distances very well. In spite of this, Burtz was actually a pretty cool guy once you got to know him. He was an Eagle Scout and had travelled around the world a good deal, although he was very reticent about why he travelled so much. If you got him talking, he could tell some fascinating stories about the things he had done or the legends that he had heard. As the last weeks of summer camp drew to a close that year, there was a sense of melancholy among the staff members. As much as the kids had driven us crazy, we would miss them. The last of the scout troops had left that morning and Joe, Anne, Topher and I were sitting around the campfire as the last of the evening light faded. As usual, the talk turned to scary stories but we found that we had run through most of the classic ones already. The Towers of Hook Hand, Don't Turn On The Light, and The Licked Hand had already been told. and We were running short of ideas. It was Anne who finally came up with a solution. Hey, she said, why don't we tell each other the scariest true story that we know? Here we go with Baron Von Ruthless 91 and that Aztec idol again, said Topher. Don't even joke about that, I replied. I'll go first, volunteered Anne. Have you guys heard about those murders that happened up on the Mid-State Trail a few miles from here? We agreed that we had. The campers had spoken little else for the last couple of weeks. Well, continued Anne, 
You guys don't know the full story. The cops are treating it as a homicide because one of the guys was tied to a tree before he was killed. The strange thing is that the other man and woman who were with him were practically torn to pieces. They found parts of them up to a mile away from where they were killed. What type of man could do something like that? They also say that some other hikers on the trail have been hearing strange sounds at night. Probably a coyote, suggested Joe. They make pretty weird noises sometimes. Not like this they don't, said Anne. That's how I found out about all this stuff. My dad is a zoologist and they brought him a recording of the sounds the hikers heard on the trail. He said it definitely wasn't any coyote he'd ever heard. The strange thing is, if some kind of animal killed those three people, how did that one guy end up tied to a tree before the bear or whatever it was disemboweled him? The thought was unsettling. We sat in an uncomfortable silence for several minutes and we nearly had a heart attack when a twig snapped in the night. It was a short huffing sound and the antlers of a large deer poked over the top of a bush. <sighs> we breathed a sigh of relief when we saw the antlers. The deer was just as scared as us as we were out of it and after a minute we heard it move away through the brush. You know, said Topher, for some reason that reminds me of something that happened to me a while ago. Topher turned to me. Do you remember that weird guy at the Order of the Arrow ordeal? Vaguely, I replied. I remember you talking about him although I never actually saw him. That's right. You didn't actually see him because we were on different work crews. Anyhow, we were at the Order of the Arrow ordeal. Topher turned to Anne. It's kind of an initiation ceremony where we spent the weeks working. We weren't supposed to talk unless absolutely necessary. To make a long story short, there was this strange guy who showed up at work and just watched us. Since we couldn't talk, we couldn't ask him who he was or what he was doing there. He just stood in the trees by where we were working and looked at us. It was really creepy. I had to run back to the dining hall at one point to use the restroom and he actually followed me for a little bit. Well, until I ran into one of the scoutmasters. I probably should have told someone about the guy, but I thought I would just get in trouble for talking. Well, that is a little bit creepy, admitted Joe. I probably wouldn't consider it to be the scariest thing that ever happened to me, though. You didn't see the guy, said Topher. It was the way he looked at you. He looked at us like the way a snake watches a rat before eating it. The reason I thought of this story just now is because of the way those noises that Anne mentioned. That night, when we were walking back from the big campfire, I remember hearing some kind of weird animal. It sounded like a cross between a lion and a hyena. Is that what those hikers recorded on the trail? I'm not sure, replied Anne. The sound my dad heard really gave him the creeps, but he wouldn't let me listen to it. At this point, there was another sound in the forest. This one was unfortunately all too familiar to the four of us. It was the unmistakable sound of Kyle's voice, followed by a feminine giggle from whoever was with him. A minute later, Kyle stepped into the firelight with a dark-haired girl who was clearly drunk, leaning against his shoulder. Well, hello, everyone, exclaimed Kyle, in a voice that was just a little bit too loud. I was fairly sure that he'd been drinking as well. I hope I'm not interrupting anything. When he said this, Kyle made sure to leer at Joe and Anne. Anne narrowed her eyes angrily and looked as if she were about to reply with a snappy retort until Joe placed his arm on her shoulder. After a second, she relaxed. Kyle had spent the previous summer trying to seduce Anne to no avail. Then, at the very end of the last summer, Anne's little brother, Tyler, had died in an accident. He had been two years behind us and had worshipped the ground that Joe had walked on. He'd been on camp staff with us and had been one of the kindest souls that I'd ever met. He'd gone out on a walk late one night and had fallen down a ravine where he broke his neck to the point where it almost decapitated. I still remember seeing the paramedics take out his body the next morning. The strangest thing about the situation is that the most vivid thing in my memory was the Captain America t-shirt that Tyler was wearing. 
The shirt was all torn up and covered in blood, and the image still haunts my dreams. In the aftermath of the tragedy, it was rumoured that Kyle had taken advantage of Anne's emotional state for his own purposes, although we never dared to ask her if this was true. Anne had only just started to recover a couple of months previously, when she had started dating Joe, and every lecherous look that Kyle gave her was like a slap in the face. What are you all up to? Kyle asked, pretending to not notice the death glares we were giving him. Oh, and by the way, this is Whitney, he said gesturing to the girl hanging off to his shoulder. She was hiking along the trail and got lost. I offered to put her up for the night until she could get her bearings. After all, there is a murderer on the loose. Whitney giggled again, and the rest of us tried not to visibly cringe. Uh, we were kind of telling each other scary stories about things that have happened to us, Joe said quietly. I guess it's my turn now. Carl had a harsh guffaw. If this is going to be about that poor baby Tyler again, he jeered. At this point, I even started to stand up to show Carl exactly what I thought of him. Thankfully, for my well-being, Carl was pale and scrawny, but surprisingly strong. Topher stopped me. He's not worth it, he said quietly. What is Carl talking about? asked Anne. Did something happen between you and Tyler? Joe winced. It was clear that he had not been planning on telling his particular story. It's kind of complicated, he began. The thing is, I suffer from something called sleep paralysis. It's when you wake up from a dream and are conscious, but you can't move. Sometimes, you also see strange hallucinations. The most often hallucinations for me are long fingered shadows with way too many teeth. I would wake up at three in the morning and not be able to move. After a few minutes, I would hear my closet door open or something move under my bed. And then the shadow creatures would appear. Sometimes they would actually touch me. Even though I know they aren't real, I can still feel them brushing against my face or sitting on my chest. I had one of these episodes the night Tyler died. I woke up, but I couldn't move or talk. I saw Tyler sit up in bed. I saw him look at his phone and then go outside. He must have got on a text message or something. The point is that I saw a bunch of the shadow creatures follow him outside. I know it doesn't make any sense. There was no way I could have warned him. I just feel like I could have stopped his accident. And I couldn't. By this point in the story there was tears streaming down both Joe and Anne's faces. Anne gently put her arm around her boyfriend's shoulder and the two of them quietly wept. The silence lasted for another minute before Kyle interrupted again. Well, he said, that's all well and fine, but I have a real story to tell. It is a tale of what really happened to Ron Grayson. Kyle paused dramatically to let the words sink in. Ron Grayson had been a local lawyer 10 years previously who had one day vanished off the face of the earth. They found his car abandoned in a supermarket parking lot and his cell phone in the river a few miles away. But there was never any body found. The incident was one of our area's biggest mysteries and, even 10 years later, just about everybody had a theory about what had happened to him. The prevailing theory was that he had either committed suicide or ran afoul of some inner city mob boss but there was no conclusive proof either way. No one knows what happened to him, I said. The man could have been abducted by aliens for all we know. Kyle smirked. That's what you think. See, this is the thing. Remember two years ago where I had to spend a couple of days in jail on those drug charges? We remembered. The charges had eventually been dropped. My cellmate was this guy who worked for the Mafia as a hired killer. He was there, waiting for trial. We raised our eyes sceptically. I'm serious. This guy was a hardcore killer. He was a mess though. Apparently, there was a hit that went wrong a few years back. He and his partner were supposed to off this lawyer who was filing charges against his boss. So his boss sends my buddy and his partner to make the problem go away. The thing is, my buddy's old partner is like a cat. He likes to play with his food before he eats it. Anyhow, he convinces my buddy to kidnap this kid. They found some homeless kid up in Pittsburgh 
that no one would miss, and they bring him down here. They have this lawyer tied up in the woods, and they tell him that they will let him go as long as he shoots the kid. Sure enough, this lawyer guy shoots the kid to save his skin. The problem is that the lawyer is a horrible shot, so this kid doesn't die right away. He starts screaming bloody murder, and then something in the forest starts screaming back. My buddy gets spooked, so he gets in the car and leaves his friend to finish the job. The thing is, his friend never comes back. My buddy goes to the place where they had the lawyer the next day. And there is nothing there. No lawyer, no kid, no psycho killer for hire, and no monster. Anyhow, that's how this guy told me the story. The next day he hangs himself in the cell. I get out and look up any disappearances around the time this guy says the stuff happened and I see that Ron Grayson disappeared around that time so there you have it the lawyer was eaten by a monster maybe it was the same one that killed those hikers once again there was a sound in the bushes and we all jumped off in the distance we heard a faint howl at the time I figured that it was a coyote but now I'm not so sure a second later a light shone through the tree branches and there was a strange rumbling sound. We all let out a breath of relief when Bert's golf cart came puttering around the bend in the trail, huffing and puffing as if he'd had to just run a marathon. Bert heaved himself off the golf cart and sat down by the fire. Reaching into his pocket he pulled out a peppermint candy and tossed it to Kyle. Topher held out his hand for a candy as well, but Bert pretended not to see him. Well, that's that. Bert sighed. I just finished to run through the camp and everything is more or less in good shape. Although Troop 83 did leave a giant archway in the middle of the campsite for some reason. I guess that means we should be able to get on the road pretty early tomorrow then, I said. I'm looking forward to a few days rest before head back to school for the semester. I think it's your turn to tell a scary story, Joe said to me. And so I began my tale. Kyle's story actually reminded me of something, I began. I think it's actually Ron Grayson at this very camp a year back or so. Uh, he's dead, interrupted Kyle. Didn't you hear my story? Well, it must have been his ghost then, I continued. It was really weird at any rate. I was doing a night patrol of the camp last summer, and I thought I saw someone down by the trading post. I just caught a glimpse of him as he walked around the corner. I thought it was weird, and I didn't recognise him as one of the scoutmasters. So, so, I decided to investigate a little bit more. I walked up to the trading post porch, and there was this man standing in the corner looking out over the lake. There were a few scouts on the other side of the lake, and the man was watching them. We stood there like that for a while, him watching the scouts, and me watching him. Then he turned around suddenly and saw me. Then, I swear I am not making this up, he grew a giant pair of antlers and screeched at me, and took off into the forest. I thought about telling someone about this at the time, but I thought no one would believe me. The point is, I was reading the paper a few months ago and I saw some news report about Ron Grayson, and they had a picture of him. I realised that he was the man that I saw on the porch. Well, at least before he grew that pair of antlers and did that best Nazgul imitation in my face. I actually have a picture of the article on my phone if you guys want to see it. I passed my phone around to the others in the group and when it reached Topher, he went as white as a sheet. What's wrong? I asked. Nothing, nothing, he replied. When he saw that none of us believed him, he reluctantly continued. It's just that that lawyer looks an awful lot like that guy who was following me around in my story. My turn, my turn, called Whitney, still very much intoxicated. I was hiking the Mid-State Trail last year, just like I'm doing now in fact. One night, I tried some new, she cast a suspicious glance at Bert, and then continued in a quieter tone of voice. Stuff, uh, tried some new stuff. It gave me the biggest high of my life, but it also made me see some strange things. So, anyhow, here I am in the middle of the woods and I have to go take a crap. So I go off by myself and take care of business. 
Keep in mind, during this entire thing, the trees are trying to tell me the meaning of life. Anyhow, I'm on my way back when I see Count Dracula fighting with Captain America on top of this hill. I realise that this is just the drugs, of course, but I still don't want them to see me. I can hear them yelling at each other. Captain was telling the Count to stay away from my sister, or something like that. It was weird. Eventually, Count Dracula hits Captain America over the head with a stick and then throws him down the other side of the hill. At this point, I decide to get out of there, so I slip away. On my way back to campsite, I see all kinds of crazy things. The trees started trying to attack me. These little goblins would laugh at me from behind the rocks. I think I also remember a bunch of bears or deer ballet dancing. It was a weird night. I'm tired. I think I'm going to go to sleep now. With that, Whitney lay down and began to snore. None of us quite knew what to make of that story. But philosophically stared into the fire before tossing Carl another peppermint candy. For some reason, Joe seemed particularly disturbed. She said she saw Captain America getting thrown down a hill by a vampire. He mused. The image of a bloodstained t-shirt sprang into my mind. You don't think that... Oh, for crying out loud, yelled Carl. He seemed to be very unnerved by that story as well. The look in his eye resembled that of a frightened rabbit who had just detected danger. You guys aren't... You guys aren't taking that load of bull seriously, are you? She had just ingested enough drugs to kill Charlie Sheen. Nothing she saw had any basis in what was really going on. Are we sure of that? murmured Bert. There may have been a kernel of truth hidden in her story. Come on, Whitney, we are leaving, Carl said, roughly shaking Whitney awake. Not now, Edward. I want to sleep, she replied and then promptly went back to snoring. This response seemed to anger Carl even more, swearing at all of us. He stormed away from the fire into the night. Did he really kill my brother? asked Anne quietly. We will probably never know for sure, said Bert. Whitney probably doesn't recognise what she saw consciously. No jury in the world would ever convict based on something that may have been a drug hallucination. Although the fact that she just called Kyle Edward is telling. I saw Kyle and Tyler having a heated discussion the day before he died. I mentioned this fact to the police, but the coroner ruled the death as an accident, and that was that. So, he is just going to get away with murder, said Topher angrily. Where is the justice in that? Sometimes, there is no justice in this life, replied Bert. Sometimes, we have to wait for the next life for our reward or punishment. In this case, however, I think the situation will take care of itself. It's getting late, and I have a scary story to tell you as well, before we go to bed. It's about a creature that was once called the Wendigo. As Bert began his story, the fire seemed to die down, and a cold wind sent a chill down our spines. Whitney let out a whimper in her sleep and curled up into a ball close to the coals of the fire. The shadows at the edges of the light seemed to stretch closer and the insects and the night birds fell silent as if they too were listening to Bert tell his story. The Native Americans would tell their children tales about the Wendigo. They sometimes called him a forest giant. The story goes that the Wendigo could change his shape so that no one could see him coming or kill him. The legend also goes that a man could become a Wendigo if he ever ate human flesh. That is how the old stories used to go. When I was a lot younger, I met a medicine man when I was doing some work on a reservation. He told me some stories about these creatures. He said that a man didn't have to be a cannibal in order to be turned into a Wendigo anymore. Although that was a still a good way to become one if anyone wanted such a thing. The man said that the Wendigo was in constant pain as a result of the curse. As the years went by, the pain would get worse and worse until it drove the Wendigo into a frenzy where it killed anything in its path. The medicine man said that there was only one way for the Wendigo to stop the pain and that was for the Wendigo to attack someone who had been wicked as it was. Someone with innocent blood on their hands and turn them into a Wendigo. Then the pain would fade for a while and eventually the original Wendigo would die after it had created a few new Wendigos. It is very difficult to kill a Wendigo, although there are certain things that attract them 
or repel them. They don't like lights and the smell of garlic, for example, while fresh blood, peppermint, and the sound of young children will attract them like moths to a flame. A few years after the Second World War, there was a little boy who claims that he saw a Wendigo. He had gone out on an overnight backpacking trip with his troop when he became very sick. One of the scoutmasters had to drive him back in the dark along with one of the other scouts because of the buddy system. Now, this scoutmaster was not a nice man. He had only recently come to the United States and he claimed that he was Dutch. However, a lot of people who were actually German claimed to be Dutch in order to become into the United States. We were not that friendly towards the German scene as we had just fought a war against them. The rumour in the scout troop was that this particular adult leader was one of these Germans who pretended to be Dutch. The rumour further went that not only was this man German, but he had been a Nazi. At any rate, the leader and the two boys were driving along the back roads towards the hospital when all of a sudden they would see this man standing in the centre of the road. The adult leader swerves the car to avoid this guy and ends up crashing into a tree. One of the scouts was knocked unconscious in the crash, but the leader and the sixth scout were still all right. The leader gets out of the car and goes over to where the man is standing and starts to yell at him. The man doesn't say anything. He just stares at the leader and the two scouts. The sixth scout is back at the car and managed to drag his friend out of the wrecked vehicle where the scoutmaster had left them. At this point, the man in the road grows this big pair of antlers and opens his mouth wide. The scout can see all of that the man's teeth are at least three times the size of a normal man's teeth and they are very, very sharp. The strange man jumps on the scoutmaster and begins to tear him apart before coming after the boys. Luckily, the one scout managed to find a large hollow log and pulled his friend inside before the monster could get to them. The Wendigo spent the rest of the night clawing at that log trying to get at the boys. Around dawn, it went back up to the road and crouched over the body of the scoutmaster. The boy then swore that he saw the dead leader stand up and follow the monster into the woods. The sun came up and a search party found the two scouts a few hours later. The little boy has spent the rest of his life looking up information on all kinds of monsters and traveling the world to hear the various stories about them. So he too, could find out what happened to him that night. There was a long silence and Bert finished the story. Finally, Whitney let out a drunken giggle. Apparently she had woken up part way through the story. The scary stories were supposed to be true stories that actually happened to us, she said. Sorry, said Bert after a slight pause. My mistake. Well, we should probably turn in, said Joe. We have a long day tomorrow. Sounds good to me, said Bert. He turned to Whitney. Do you have somewhere to stay tonight? I have a campsite a few miles up the trail, she responded. You know what, said Bert. You can sleep on the sofa in the health lodge. Something tells me that tonight isn't a good night to be out in the woods alone. Bert helped Whitney into the golf cart and the two drove off down the trail. In the distance, there was a very faint sound that could have been a human scream was suddenly silenced. Shortly afterwards, there was a strange call that sounded like a cross between a lion's roar and a hyena's laugh. Topha, Joe, Anne and I decided to share the tent that last night. I had a funny feeling that we would never see Kyle again and we didn't. Topher claims that it's probably because he ran away for fear of getting arrested for murder. I'm not so certain. That last night in the woods, I remember drifting off to sleep with dreams full of antlered men and peppermint candies. This isn't exactly a terrifying story, per se, but it is my real experience. I've talked about this before on live streams, but I've never sat down and really documented this. I spent a significant amount of time during my childhood growing up in a haunted house. We as a race have an uncanny ability to just go with the flow. So when someone tells you you can never get used to something like this, I'm telling you, you can, given the right circumstances. Thinking back, I was around seven at the time. 
We lived on Church Street, a little side street off of a larger side street. My parents and I lived across from my grandparents, and at the same time my parents bought a house. A very short time later, my grandparents had done the same. The house they bought was on one of the more major back roads in my town. This house was old. A few years before they bought it, the upstairs had been converted into an apartment. They lived on the first floor, and when they took over, there were already tenants living on the second. I can remember the first time I went into the attic with my grandpa. It was cold, considering it was in the middle of the summer. That was a bit strange. There wasn't any ventilation up there, and the air was a bit stagnant. But, being a child, this never struck me as odd. The attic made an L shape, and the only window was in the main area of the attic, across from where a staircase led up to that main area. At the immediate left, the top of the staircase was a door. Beyond this door was a fully finished off bedroom. Something to this day I always thought was a bit odd. I've never seen something like this and couldn't imagine why anyone would ever want to sleep up there. Time went on, and I barely ventured into the attic. Only a few times with my grandfather. He would never let me go up there, and I always figured it was due to him just doing his grandfatherly duty to not let me hurt myself up there or mess with his stuff. The tenants moved out about a year in, and my aunt and uncle moved in behind them. My uncle and I were close, and we would watch movies together quite a bit. You see, I grew up with horror and science fiction as a part of my daily life. My grandpa and I would watch a lot of Alfred Hitchcock, The Twilight Zone, and Doctor Who. And as you may have guessed, my uncle and I watched a lot of horror movies. It was always the B-movies, the best for the gore, and copious amounts of boobies. Here was the thing. Later at night, when watching said horror movies, we would always hear walking right above us, and I always thought it was my grandfather would be walking around up there. The why he would at that time of night was beyond me. So, one night, I asked my uncle if he was always up there like that, and that's when he dropped a bomb on me. My grandfather rarely went up there. It kind of blew my mind, and it may not seem like much to you, but to my now eight-year-old mind, it was a major revelation. You mean we have a ghost? I was excited, like we had just gotten a puppy. You have to understand, growing up and watching all these shows and movies, and as well, repeatedly being told that it wasn't real, made me think that way. I've never been the most trusting person, nor the believing type. I really thought it was all just BS. And we decided it would be a good idea to go upstairs and take a look. You know, the first thing that really caught my attention, the light in the back hall was out. If Grandpa was up in the attic, the light would be on. And I imagine you could guess the light in the attic itself was off when we opened up the door. My uncle brought a flashlight with him in an attempt to make it a little creepier. He never turned the attic light on. We shuffled to the top of the short staircase leading into the attic. It was normal save for the fact that the lights were off and it was 11 o'clock at night no footsteps nothing moving around it wasn't until he swept the flashlight through that I caught a glimpse of a shadow in the far corner where the sunlight doesn't reach I know what I saw it was a figure man sized but just black I tightened up couldn't breathe for a moment like holding your breath as you go underwater I stood there shivering I'm pretty sure you couldn't pry my ass apart with the jaws of life. I felt like a statue. It was the only time in my life where I was completely frozen in fear. My uncle apparently didn't see what I saw, and we promptly went downstairs and finished the movie. I could tell, though, he was a bit bothered by the fact that something was walking around and no one was there. Being the person that I was, and still am, I couldn't get that off my mind. What I'd seen. Yes, it scared the bejesus right out of me. My curiosity was stronger. The next time I went to my grandparents' house, I grabbed a bunch of my Hot Wheels and snuck up to the attic. I sat down on the second step from the top and let my imagination take over. I started playing with my cars. It didn't take long to get that feeling. This being the middle of the day, I looked and the figure was there in the far corner. 
Yes, it was dark, but a minute amount of light was seeping in. It was darker than the darkness itself, and after a few moments of resisting the urge to run, I just started to talk. It never moved, and the feeling of fear started to drown away. As strange as that may sound, and yes, I know exactly what it sounds like, this became a regular occurrence for me. And yes, I named my ghost. The years ticked on. I grew up, and life had its way with everything as it normally does. My grandfather passed away when I was 19, and my grandmother sold the house not long after that. And here is one of those small world moments. She sold the house to a man that she went to school with. He brought his son up from Georgia, and he and I became friends. And it didn't take him long to find my little friend. He began asking me questions, and in turn I filled him in on my history with said shadow in the corner. We started going into the attic around midnight, with just a lighter and a candle, and we would talk to the spirit. We would ask him to blow out the candle and move things around a bit, and he complied. I think the whole strange thing in all of this is it wasn't scary. I felt a tad unnerved, but never enough to go running and screaming, and certainly not enough to keep me away from that house. Eventually, my friend joined the army and off he went. It was only by happenstance did I see him again about three years later, and I was driving by the house, and I saw him in the front yard. Of course, I stopped, and we were able to reconnect. I also met his new wife. Nice girl. They had been back a few days, and of course, brought her up to the attic. But it was different this time. There was a rotting smell up there, and in hearing this, I of course made a beeline right for it. And he was right. It was off. It stunk horribly. I couldn't tell if it was a rotting meat or eggs or both. And the air just felt oppressive. It was thick and heavy. It didn't feel like it did before. Now, my buddy's wife called herself a mystic. And what that actually means, I don't know. We performed a little something in the attic, a ceremony of some kind, and we left it at that. We exchanged phone numbers and I was off. I never saw my friend again after that day. I did, however, get a phone call from his wife a few weeks later. She went on to tell me how I wasn't a good influence on her husband and how she would like it if I never contacted him again. She kind of hit the nail on the head right there. I was a bit of a shit then. But before hanging up, she did tell me the smell in the attic went away. And from what they could tell, there was no more spirit activity in the house. I don't have an explanation for this. Truth be told, I don't know if I really need one. I have my memories of this, and I've made my peace with it as well. A figure that will last in my mind until I don't have one anymore. And if you were wondering what I named my ghost, well, my friends, there are just some things I'll keep to myself. It runs in the family. Let's get straight into that. When Jessie cut her finger yesterday, something awoke inside of me. A deep, gnawing hunger. A terrible demon in my ribcage that scratched and clawed like a crazed rat in a desperate attempt to free itself. A sharp heightening of every sense, completely overwhelming me with smells and sounds in an instant. Jessie tried to lead me into the cellar, and I recoiled at her touch. I scratched and hit wildly at her, but she was able to get me down there and lock the door behind me. I heard a clunk as she secured the padlock around the handle. She was safe. Now, all we could do was wait it out. Every man in my family has shared my affliction. We don't know where it came from or where it will go, but we deal with it and try to lead normal lives. We don't know why it didn't affect the women, but we were grateful for that. Without my mother and sister, nothing would stop us from mauling each other whenever the full moon rolled around. Jessie didn't care. She loved me for me, and was there when no one else was. She was never bothered by my occasional outbursts, even when she was left with scars afterwards. We told the doctors it was our dog. 
The cellar was an escape proof. No windows and only one door. That door had multiple locks and had been reinforced countless times, but the inner side of the door was still riddled with deep scratches. After Jesse locked me in the cellar, I stumbled over to the refrigerator. As I reached forward to open it, I noticed that my fingernails were beginning to elongate. Not good. I pulled the fridge open and hastily clutched at a package of raw steaks. Ripping the package open with my now sharp nails, I gripped a steak and tore into it with sharp teeth. Blood and juices dropped down my stubbly chin and I was satisfied. I was still hungry. Heck, I was still starving. But eating meat always quelled the episode much faster. I finished off my steak and started on another one. And soon enough, the entire fridge had been emptied. A wave of weakness came over me as the episode came back to an end. I fell to my knees into a pool of steak blood. I quivered violently as I felt my incisors shrink and my fingernails shorten. After a few minutes of standing there, I heard the locks on the door unlock one by one. And Jessie came down the stairs. She came and knelt next to me, soaking her clothes in blood. Your dress, I mumbled, dazed. Oh, whatever, she replied. She wrapped her arms around me and hugged me close to her. I instantly felt some strength return at her touch. I let out a shaky sigh and embraced her. It's okay. Let's go upstairs. You can clean yourself up in a bit or just go to bed. It's late, anyways. I nodded, absolutely ashamed, even though we were used to this by now. I'm going to change out of these clothes and then run over to the store to restock the fridge. I don't think I need to worry about making any dinner for you anymore. Jess, I'm so sorry. I... Pipe down, Fido, Jessie said in stern yet warm manner. Let's get you to the bathroom. You're pretty weak, so you better be in bed when I get back. I felt like a toddler being scolded, but Jessie was right. She handled these situations much better than anyone else would. I'm glad that she was the one here to help me, and not someone else. Jessie helped me up and I leaned on her shoulder as we slowly went up the staircase, step by step. She continued helping me along until we got to the bathroom. She grabbed me some sweatpants and a clean t-shirt to change into, and then went into our bedroom to change herself. I leaned against the sink for a few minutes, gaining my bearings. As Jessie finished tidying up, she came back to the bathroom. Alright, I'll be back in half hour. Love you, Jacob. She gave me a kiss on the cheek and closed the bathroom door behind her. I took a shower, relishing in the cool water. It relaxed me after having such an unexpected recurrence. Usually, it was only the full moon that caused these outbursts, but certain situations could make them occur otherwise. I stepped out of the shower and put on the clean, comfortable clothes that Jess left out for me. Looking at myself in the mirror, I was ashamed. My eyes were a yellowish colour and my pupils dilated. My facial hair had gotten out of control. All of my hair grows much faster than any normal man's would, so shaving is a hassle as I have to do so much almost every night. I was a mess. I shaved and I went to bed. I was still wound up so I flipped on the TV and watched some mindless program until I heard Jessie come through the door. I could hear her footsteps going down the stairs restocking the fridge and then coming back up and coming into our room. Ah, you look a lot better now, Jake, she smiled. She took a ten minute shower and then came back out to go to sleep. In the light coming from the bathroom, I could see that there was a cut across her face. My heart dropped. Jessie, did I? Your face, it's, it's okay. Get some rest. You'll probably be back to normal in the morning. No, I, I scratched you, didn't I? That's anything but okay, Jess. Jess walked over to her side of her bed and laid down next to me. She put her arm around me. If I can't handle you at your worst, I don't deserve you at your best, Jake. She whispered. It's different, I insisted. You shouldn't have to deal with this. I'll deal with anything. If it means that I can be with you, go to sleep. Tears welled in my eyes and I nestled into her. What did I do to deserve you? 
When Jessie fell asleep, her slow, steady breaths calmed me, and I was able to drift off. I remembered my father's words to me when I was a young boy, still struggling with the fact that I had to deal with this condition for the rest of my life. A weakened mental state only makes it harder to fight off, my father had said to me. Remember the ones you love, remember me, and Mama, and Joey, and Kate. Let that strength fuel you. And I'll admit, it was far easier to return to normal that night than it usually was. I'll think of Jess next time. Everything was normal for the next week or so. I went to my stupid minimum wage job on the weekdays, then came the night of the full moon. We had already prepared. Full moon nights were the worst because they lasted longer and the transformation was much more noticeable. I was locked in the cellar, waiting. This was the worst part of all, just waiting. And as the edge of the sun disappeared over the horizon and the moon started to rise, it began. I quaked and fell onto my hands and knees. My incisors grew longer and sharper, cutting into my gums. My fingernails darkened to a greyish colour, elongating into claws. Everything hurt. I remembered my dad's words, think of the ones you care about. I thought about Jessie. Sweet, sweet Jessie, beautiful, kind Jessie. I wanted her. I needed her. I had to find her. I had to get her. I was so hungry. I was starving. No, 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 no. I came to my senses. I had to stay away from her. I had to keep her safe. I was a monster. I couldn't get her out of my head. The gnawing hunger. I couldn't bear it. I ripped open the refrigerator door and swayed precariously, threatening to fall over. I tore open packages of steaks, pork chops, chicken breasts, my face covered in juices and blood as I finished them all off in rapid succession. So, so hungry. Finally, in the back of the fridge, there was a whole turkey. God knows where Jessie found one in early March. I desperately ripped the plastic packaging apart and ripped up the turkey until there was nothing left. There was nothing left. I'm starving, starving. And in my stupor, I remembered last night's news. No more, nobody else, no more of this. Please, stop this, please. I banged madly on the cellar door. Jesse, no, please, no, run. The hunger was consuming me. Jesse, I roared, open up. She did. I don't know why she opened the door. Maybe she thought that the fit was over and that I wanted to come back upstairs to sleep. Maybe she had a death wish. All I know is that she regretted it. From there, it's hazy. I remember her screaming, crying. I cried too, but I don't regret what I did. Nobody else should have to deal with what I deal with. I told her, I told her, I didn't want kids. I told her that I didn't want to bring someone into this world just so they could suffer too. I'm going to kill them all. Papa, Mama, Joey, Kate. No more suffering. Afterwards, I may go live in the woods like the monster that I am. I may turn myself in so I can rot in jail like I deserve to. Or I may just kill myself. Rid the world of our race. Keep them safe. Keep them blissfully ignorant. It can't run in a family if there's no family to begin with. A little bit of context before I start this. It was Christmas night. The day was pleasant and festive. Opening presents early in the morning with my sisters. Hearty breakfast made my dad. Delicious smells from the kitchen as mom and dad prepared a feast. Visits from extended family bringing pies and cakes for dessert. Around two, we all sat down to eat and then lazed about for the rest of the afternoon into the evening. Now to the story. At uh, about eight, after everyone had left and the food was all put away for round two of the following day, I decided to head over to visit my friend in the next village. The drive would be about ten minutes, if I took back roads to get there, so I did. First, a little background on where my friend lived. It was a housing development, surrounded by private lakes. You might call it a gated community. 
You could still drive through it freely after hours by entering one of four private entry points. Since the community was built around a lake, the road surrounding it went into a spiral sort of shape. The houses were sparsely positioned on the outermost part of the spiral road, closest to the four private entry points. As you drove in further, there were a lot more houses positioned closer and closer to the lake. My friend lived on the outer edge of this development, so once I reached the entry point, I would only take a few more minutes until I reached his house. His house, along with all the others, were far enough apart that you couldn't see them from the road as you drove by. There were either woods all around with long drives or open fields with long drives. You could see porch lights on in the distance, but that was about it. As I entered into the development, the speed limit dropped from 30 miles down to 20. There were no street lights in the development, and for some reason, I never put my high beams on. I couldn't go any faster than the speed limit because there were speed bumps in every 30 feet or so. It was uh, about midnight. I remember having my driver's side window open slightly, taking in some fresh air. I remember driving in silence, which was usual for me. I must have been enjoying the quietness after a commotion of Christmas Day. I reached a section of road that had been barren fields on either side and wood set back. Houses were probably nestled back into the trees. As I drove, I noticed that something looked like someone walking up on a road ahead on the opposite side of the road, coming in my direction. Mind you, I was still going about 20 miles per hour the whole time, so it was probably less than a minute by the time the walker came into clear view. I got a quick scan of it in my windshield before my car was parked exactly in the parallel. This is what I saw. It was not a person. It stood on two legs, with long arms hanging down from its shoulders. It was strong-looking, lean, muscular, but not beefy in stature. It looked thin at the same time. It stood at least seven feet tall. It was light-colored, not sure whether it was white, tan, yellow, or gray. It didn't appear to have fur, but some texture to the skin was there. It definitely wasn't smooth. There appeared to be something coming down off its back. I don't know what this was. All I can recall about its face as small features that it had, but the mouth and jaw were noticeably large. And it had pointed things atop its head. Two things going straight upward, with something mingled between the two things. That's what I got from a quick scan, and from my observation of it, as it neared my car, and my car neared it. As my car became parallel to within a split second, I went from looking at my windshield to looking at it from my driver's side window. In that moment, its face quickly peered down at me, and all I remember was the mouth opening wide. Out came a remarkable scream that I'll never forget. It gives me chills just thinking about it. It consisted of a high-pitched shriel. Shriek enveloped by a deep, guttural growl. Both sounds happened simultaneously in that scream. I kept driving all the while. This was all happening so fast that I couldn't even have the chance to be scared or shocked or anything. I continued driving and went past my friend's house and drove home. I called him to tell him what happened and that I just need to get back. I was probably running on adrenaline to get back home. Later on, I was in total shock after it sunk in. Had my driver's side window been opened fully, it could have touched me, or worse, taken me. I'm certain of it. To this day, I still haven't worked out what it was. Anyone else ever see or hear anything similar to this? D&T, this is for you, bro. Dead man talking while the rakes are creeping. Venomous furbage more than snake fangs leaking. DMT portal to the afterlife. The hellhound, the horror serpent sacrifice. To make his bleed, that's what fear needs. Sit back, relax, have your beer and weed as we take a trip down a long dirt road where the hills have eyes, werewolves and wendigos. Where the little DMT, Stephen King's a nail biter. Shriveled up and frail, smoking shit with a lighter. From five minutes of these tales from the dead, pull the code is on your head and don't look under the bed dead man talking dead 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 dead, dead man talking yes yeah, shadow eyes
Wow. Hope you guys have enjoyed this special edition of DMT, Forest of Fear. A humongous thank you for the uh, consistent support and uh, advice from the, the likes of Swamp Dweller, uh, DDoS, Alicia, obviously my wife and my children. Um, but especially a big thank you to all of you listeners that um, have tuned in time and time again and uh, left such wonderful comments and it really humbled me. Huge, huge thank you to Swamp Dweller, Chaos Theory Productions, Jeff, Natalie, and, of course, Shadow Wise on the beat there at the end. Absolutely appreciate all your support, guys, as ever. If you ever need anything, just holler me. People, make sure you check out their wonderful, wonderful channels. I will leave the links down below in the description. And uh, make sure you smash that subscribe button. Quick special thanks to Jeremy Harrison, Jonathan Doughty, Brian Neely, Doomslayer, CT, Gail Jenkins, Robert Woodcock, Faith Ruxtershell, Beyond the Visual Spectrum, Tater Plays, Lady B Boss, Angel, Faye Brown, Smokey Beardman, Dr. Creepin' Van Pasta, Mike Long, Renegade Tanker, Francis247, Shane Barber, Joe Hartnett, and Lily Campbell. Guys, if I've missed out your name, I do apologise, but believe me, I recognise each and every one of your comments, and uh, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Here's to the road to the 5k milestone and beyond. And uh, I can't thank you guys enough. Um, I would recommend this to anybody that wants to get involved in narration or research. It's been eye-opening and uh, has made me rethink a lot of things. Let me know what you thought down below, guys. As ever, please do like and share. And remember, above all, be safe, not sorry.